Welcome to our Thursday Bible study here at College United Methodist Church. We're moving on into chapter 11 of Paul's letter to the church in Rome. But before we do that, I want to remind you of a few of the things that we are going to be doing for Advent this year. We have started our Every Tuesday Advent videos. Every Tuesday we will show a video, and these are kind of kitchen table talks with pastors. You can find that on our Facebook page or our YouTube channel. December 4th, now that's tomorrow, the Christmas tree will be lit up in front of the museum. There's going to be some groups singing under our porch on the museum side of the church. Now this is going to be a drive-through event from 5.30 until 7.30. And Santa Claus is going to be there handing out some candy canes as well. A blue Christmas service will be sometime in early December. It will be on a weeknight and it is a special service that acknowledges that so many people in our congregation have experienced some type of loss and not just in this past year. A drive through living nativity is going to happen December 18th and 19th from 6 to 8 p.m. on the museum side of the church. Carrie Owen from Living Faith Church is in charge of volunteers, so email me if you want to be a part of that and I will put you in touch with Carrie. We're going to have some Advent meditations between now and Christmas. These will be poems, prayers, or other readings from members of the congregation. And you'll be able to see them on Facebook or YouTube, and that's going to happen every day. Let me know if you have a poem or a prayer or a reading that you would like to contribute to that project. And finally, we will have an online Christmas Eve service with scripture and special music. Now our Bible study schedule is going to change. This week we have a short session on chapter 11. Next week will be December 10th and we're going to stop Romans and read Luke chapter 1. Then on the 17th we will read Luke chapter 2. And then the next Thursday will be Christmas Eve. And we will be broadcasting our Christmas Eve service. Now, we will not have Bible study the last Thursday in December. And in January, we will start back up on January the 7th. And that's where we will come back into Romans and we will begin back beginning with chapter 12. So that's our schedule for the next several weeks. Let's go ahead and start on chapter 11 of Paul's letter to the church in Rome. Now remember that chapters 9, 10, and 11 are a section that is referred to as Paul's meditation on Israel, where he writes about his ideas about salvation for the Jews. This chapter 11 we're going to read today has some controversial passages in it because it is in chapter 11 that Paul quotes Deuteronomy again in the part where he talks about people not believing because God gave them a dull spirit so that their eyes would not see and their ears not hear. And Paul says that God was still, now during this time that he's writing to the Romans, God is still deliberately keeping the Jews from seeing the salvation that is available in Jesus. Now that's an interesting proposal from Paul. And let's start into this with verse 1. So I ask you, has God rejected his people? Absolutely not. I'm an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God hasn't rejected his people whom he knew in advance. Or don't you know what the scripture says in the case of Elijah when he pleads with God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets and they have torn down your altars. I'm the only one left and they're trying to take my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 people who haven't bowed their knees to Baal. So also in the present time, there is a remaining group 
by the choice of God's grace. But if it is by grace, it isn't by what's done anymore. If it were, God's grace wouldn't be grace. God chooses those he will save through faith in the gospel. We are responsible for our acceptance or our rejection of him and his gospel. So, the Jews are responsible for their refusal to turn to Christ, but Paul says they have not come to faith because God has not chosen to have mercy on them. Okay, that's the summary of the teachings of Romans 9 and 10. And so now, this question still. Did God reject his people? Did God reject Israel? Did, meaning, did God reject the descendants of Abraham? Now, Paul gives four arguments to demonstrate that God has not, in fact, rejected Israel. Uh, verse 1 is what we're going to call the Paul argument. Paul points out that he himself, the major missionary of the early church, is a Jew. He's saying, look at me, I'm a Jew. How can we say that God has given up on the Jews when he didn't give up on me? He took me and is using me. Now verse 2 is the election argument. Remember, in chapter 9, we saw that to foreknow is more than to foresee. Paul is saying that God has determined, has preordained to bring Jews to faith in him. Those he has foreknown, they can't fail to believe. Now, verses 2 through 4, then, is the Elijah argument. Elijah was someone who thought that God had abandoned Israel and that no one believed apart from him. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword, and I'm the only one left. Now, Paul points out in Romans here 11, 4, I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Now, what Paul is doing is he's paraphrasing God's answer to Elijah way back in 1 Kings. In other words, there's always been in Israel a faithful remnant, the spiritual Israel, the spiritual descendants of Abraham. Even during times when it seemed that Israel had utterly rejected God and he had utterly rejected them, there was always this spiritual remnant that God has preserved. Okay, now we've got verses 5 and 6, and we'll call that the grace argument. Paul says, so too at the present time. So what he means is that like Elijah, we are mistaken to think that all of Israel is being rejected. No, Paul says there's a remnant chosen by grace, no longer by works. And Paul means this what guarantees that there will always be a faithful remnant is not that there is always a set of good, decent people who will believe, but rather that there's always the grace of God. It is God who preserves a remnant. And those who believe so don't do because of their works, but entirely because of God's grace. Okay, let's move on into 7. So what? Israel didn't find what it was looking for. Those who were chosen found it, but the others were resistant. As it is written, God gave them a dull spirit so that their eyes would not see and their ears not hear right up until the present day. And David says their table should become a pitfall and a trap, a stumbling block and payback to them for what they have done. Their eyes should be darkened so they can't see and their backs always bent. So here in verse 7, Paul's reminding us not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. What, what Israel? The nation as a whole or the, or the great majority? Sought so earnestly 
it did not obtain but the elect, which is Israel's believing minority, and that includes Paul. Now, what Paul has done here is he's quoting from Isaiah, but Isaiah was paraphrasing Moses back from Deuteronomy. So Paul's saying, Moses warned Israel in his day that their rebellion resulted in God giving them spiritual blindness. Isaiah told Israel that this has continued to this very day. And so now Paul is telling the people from the church in Rome that this is still going on. So he's quoting Isaiah, who's referring to Moses. It's all still going on. Okay, verse 11. So I'm asking you, they haven't stumbled so that they've fallen permanently, have they? Absolutely not. But salvation has come to the Gentiles by their failure in order to make Israel jealous. But if their failure brings riches to the world and their defeat brings riches to the Gentiles, how much more will come from the completion of their number? I'm speaking to you Gentiles, considering that I'm an apostle to the Gentiles, I publicize my own ministry in the hope that somehow I might make my own people jealous and save some of them. If their rejection has brought about a close relationship between God and the world, how can their acceptance mean anything less than life from the dead? But if part of a batch of dough is offered to God as holy, the whole batch of dough is holy too. If a root is holy, the branches will be holy too. If some of the branches were broken off, and you were a wild olive branch, and you were grafted in among the other branches, and shared the root that produces the rich oil of the olive tree, then don't brag like you're better than the other branches. If you do brag, be careful. It's not you that sustains the root, but it's the root that sustains you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Fine, they were broken off because they weren't faithful. But you stand only by your faithfulness. So don't think in a proud way. Instead, be afraid. If God didn't spare the natural branches, he won't spare you either. So look at God's kindness and harshness. It's harshness toward those who fail, but it's God's kindness for you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you could be cut off too. And even those who were cut off will be grafted back in, if they don't continue to be unfaithful because God is able to graft them in again. If you were naturally part of a wild olive tree and you were cut off from it and then contrary to nature you were grafted into the cultivated olive tree, won't these natural branches stand an even better chance of being grafted back onto their own olive tree? Paul sets out three stages that Israel will go through with regard to the gospel of Jesus. In the first stage, Israel transgressed, but it brought salvation to the Gentiles. In the second stage, the Gentiles make Israel jealous. And Paul goes on to say that one of the goals of his ministry is to make his own people envy and therefore to save some of them. Now finally, Paul talks about a third stage. Now this is sometime in the future. In the second stage, the envy of Israel only wins some of them, but Paul is talking about a time of greater riches, of acceptance of all of the group of people that Paul previously defined as Israel. Now, Then we get into a big section of metaphor where the Gentiles are referred to as the wild branches that are grafted in place of some of the Jews that have been pruned away from this olive tree. 
Now the reason this is really a great metaphor lies in the ways that olive trees are managed because olive trees are managed in a way that, that other trees are not. There are things you can do with an olive tree that just don't work on other trees. The olive tree has this unique property that isn't shared by other trees and that's its ability to graft from other types of olive trees. In horticulture, cultivated branches are always grafted onto wild, vigorous rootstock. They do this in roses because grafting the other way doesn't work. You can't take the wild branches and graft them onto the domesticated roots except for olive trees. When wild olive branches are grafted onto a natural olive tree, a remarkable change occurs. Instead of a crop of olives, small in number and size, the wild olive produces plentiful cultivated olives, and this happens over the whole tree. When a farmer wants to increase his production of olives, but he doesn't have the space for more trees, um, or he doesn't want to wait many years for a sapling to grow into maturity, then this is what he does. He cuts off the perfectly healthy branches of a cultivated tree, lays them on the ground at the base of the tree. Then he, he takes branches from a wild tree and grafts them onto where the natural branches were cut off. Now, because these branches are from a different sort of tree in a different DNA, they don't recognize the sap as being theirs. Consequently, the tree needs to literally force the sap into these wild branches for three and a half years. This stage of the process continues without alteration and without any visible fruit. But once this period of time is over, then the farmer drills holes alongside of the grafted in branches and inserts the cultivated branches that were just laying there on the ground for three and a half years. Now these, these original branches had been cut off, had been laying on the ground, and they were all dried out. But an amazing thing takes place when the former branches are grafted back into the root the engrafted, cultivated branches become jealous of the wild branches and they begin to miraculously draw the sap and come back to life. Now, if the grafted branches, either the wild ones or the domestic ones, do not produce, then they are removed again. Paul makes a strong point there that God expects things from the newly grafted Gentiles, as well as the chosen Jews, as well as those that initially rejected Jesus, but have now come into the group of believers. Let's go back to verse 25. I don't want you to be unaware of this secret, brothers and sisters. That way you won't think too highly of yourselves. A part of Israel has become resistant until the full number of Gentiles comes in. In this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodly behavior from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. According to the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but according to God's choice, they are loved for the sake of their ancestors. God's gifts and calling can't be taken back. Once you were disobedient to God, but now you have mercy because they were disobedient. In the same way, they have also been disobedient because of the mercy that you received. So now they can receive mercy too. God has locked up all people in disobedience in order to have mercy on all of them. God's riches, wisdom, and knowledge are so deep, they are as mysterious as his judgments, and they are as hard to track as his past. 
Who has known the Lord's might? Or who has been his mentor? Or who has given him a gift and has been paid back by him? All things are from him and through him and for him. May the glory be to him forever. Amen. Once again, what does Paul mean when he says Israel? How many will be saved? What does the word all mean in verse 26? All Israel, again, probably does not mean every Jew without exception. Now, some people think that Paul must mean this last-minute, large-scale mass revival of Christianity among the Jews. Well, that could actually happen, but Paul's language, I think, allows for the possibility of a steady but growing flow of Jews into Christianity until we arrive at the place where more or most of the Jews have come to believe. People debate about this all the time. And, and I don't think this point is as important as the more important point we should draw from these passages. And that is, how should we Gentiles view the Jewish non-Christians? Despite their hostility to Jesus, God loves them because of his promises to their ancestors and God's gifts and his call, his commitment to make Israel his people are irrevocable. And then in verses 30 and 31, Paul says that the Jewish unbelievers are to be viewed with hope. The Christian is to say to themselves, I disobey God and refuse to believe the gospel. And look at me now. Here, I am a Christian in part because the gospel reached beyond Israel. So if God can reach me with his mercy through their disobedience, then certainly can he turn around and reach them with his mercy through my faith. And that is the hope that we have as Christians. This week is the Advent week of hope. Okay, we finished with what is called Paul's meditation on Israel. Remember, next Thursday we will read Luke chapter 1. The following Thursday we will read Luke chapter 2. And then the Thursday after that is Christmas Eve. And we'll be back in Romans on January the 7th. So let us end our time together in prayer. Father, without you, we can do nothing. By your Spirit, help us to know what is right and to be eager in doing your will. Teach us to find new life by reading these words of Paul. Keep us from sin. Help us to live by your commandment of love. God of love, bring us back to you during this holy season. Send your Spirit to give us hope, to make us strong in faith and active in good works. Father, during this Lenten season, nourish us with your word of life and make us one. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, we will see you on Sunday.